This morning's scripture lesson comes to us from, the, from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above the heavens, so that he might fill all things. He himself granted that some are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown, uh, blown about by every wind of doctrine by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Annual conference was held last weekend. The Missouri Annual Conference happens every year, which is why we named it the annual conference. <clears throat> I don't know if you noticed, but I was gone. Uh, Allie Fields preached the sermon uh, on Sunday. Thank you, Allie, for preaching at the three services. And I, I do want to clarify a misconception that was advanced last Sunday. The connection between the Zacchaeus story and the stature of Allie Fields <laughs> is purely coincidental. I assure you, there was nothing to that, just to clear the air there. So we were gone at annual conference. The people who go to annual conference for each congregation are the appointed clergy and then lay delegates to match the appointed clergy. So we have five appointed clergy here. There are five lay delegates who are duly nominated and elected from the congregation. The 10 of us were present at annual conference. A couple of us were virtually present, but we were present. And uh, a lot of things happen at an annual conference. This was our first time that we were able to be together as a conference for three years, and that felt really good to see some people face-to-face -face that we hadn't seen for a while. The annual conference is kind of like the clergy church, like our membership is in the annual conference. So we were seeing colleagues and friends that we hadn't seen for a long time. One of the items of business that happens at annual conference is that the appointments are formally um, finalized. The word that we have for that in Methodism is fixed. The appointments are fixed by the bishop. Doesn't mean they were broken and now have been repaired. <clears throat> it means they were formalized. And so one of the things that happened at this year's annual conference is that Pastor Andy and Jim and Winter and Phil have been f appointed to Manchester United Methodist Church officially and formally for another year, which is a good thing and <laughs> worth celebrating. And the appointment of Pastor Stephanie Lent was formalized, was fixed for her new role as the lead pastor at Fenton United Methodist Church that had been announced a few weeks ago. Stephanie will be preaching next weekend at all three of the worship services, so be here to greet her. Also, if you wish to send Stephanie with a note of uh, blessing or well wishes, we have a couple of baskets at the Information Center where you can just drop her a line and uh, wish her all the best. Stephanie attended annual 
conference and said to me that she feels a great deal of peace and fulfillment at this new adventure for her in her ministry. So we celebrate with her. Other things that happen at annual conference, let's see, we celebrate the retirements of pastors who are retiring. We celebrate commissioning of new pastors who are on their way to ordination. So we commission people. We also ordain people who have finished that commissioning process. So we ordain people for ministry. We remember clergy and clergy spouses who have died in the past year and honor their lives and ministry. And we do business like pass the budget and hear reports and do all kinds of things that conferences have to do each year. Like I said, a lot of it was pretty typical. A lot of it was stuff that we'd experienced before. Um, a lot of it was just, it was the business of the conference. But there was some stuff, there was one particular thing <clears throat> that happened at conference this year that I had never experienced before. And I've been going to annual conference as a pastor for 22 years. Um, not as many years as Nancy Dunlap has gone to annual conference, but still, nevertheless, uh, 22 years is a while, and I went some years before being a pastor as well, and I'd never experienced this bit of business that we did. We voted to affirm 11 disaffiliations from the United Methodist Church. United Methodist congregations who have chosen to leave the denomination. The reasons uh, vary, but they center around inclusion issues. And, and so the congregations that have left want to have a more traditionalist perspective. And 11 congregations followed the, pro the processes to disaffiliate, and we affirmed those disaffiliations. And just kind of felt like, it felt weird, you know? It just kind of felt a little awkward, pretty sort of not fun to do. In addition to affirming those disaffiliations, we also heard a report that there are three congregations who wish to disaffiliate from United Methodist Church, but don't want to follow the given procedure for doing so. These three congregations have actually brought a lawsuit against the conference so that they don't have to follow uh, those procedures. The congregations are Morningstar, Sunrise, and Schweitzer that have sued the conference so they don't have to follow the given process. And, and one other congregation we were told about at conference who wants to disaffiliate but hasn't started the process yet. So we talked for a minute about the 15 churches in Missouri who have decided at this point to leave the United Methodist Church. And it felt yucky. It felt weird. It wasn't a fun celebratory part of conference. <clears throat> but here, here's just a little context for you. Here's a little context. There are 750 United Methodist churches in Missouri. 750. What that means is the 15 congregations that we heard about represent 2% of United Methodist churches in Missouri. And what's more, not every member of those churches is leaving. I know personally of several United Methodists who have left their congregation that's choosing to disaffiliate to join in membership with another United Methodist church. So what that means on the flip side is that 98% of United Methodists in Missouri want to stick together. Can I get an amen? 98% of United Methodists in Missouri want to be church together. In Missouri, as far as United Methodists go, unity is the rule. Disaffiliation is the exception. And most United Methodists understand that in spite of our differences, we are one body. In spite of our diversity, we are one in Christ Jesus. And this has been true for our entire history. This goes all the way back to the founder of our movement, John Wesley. John Wesley wrote a pamphlet or a tract called The Character of a Methodist. And he wrote this. By the way, every time I read John Wesley, I kind of hear it in a British accent. So if I kind of drift into British accent, that's, <clears throat> that's wrong with this. <clears throat> the Character of a Methodist. Part of it says this. And I beseech you by the mercies of God that we be in no wise divided among ourselves. Is thy heart right as my heart is with thine? I ask no farther question. If it be, give me thy hand. 
for opinions and terms. Let us not destroy the work of God. Dost thou love and serve God? It is enough. I give thee the right hand of fellowship. You see, in our Methodist tradition, unity has always been a priority, but it's never been about conforming. Unity has always been a priority, but it's never been about uniformity. You know how some people will say, oh, all are welcome here. All are welcome here, as long as that all looks and thinks and acts exactly like the rest of us do and conforms to exactly who we are. That's not what unity means to Methodism. That's never been what unity has meant for the people called Methodists from the very start until now. Over these past four weeks, we've been thinking about unity. This worship series has been called Make Us One. In this series, we have celebrated our essential oneness in Christ. We have celebrated how the Holy Spirit redeems and restores broken relationships and builds connection and community. It has been a wonderful series, but it must be said that it is a very interesting and difficult time to be thinking about unity so much in this divisive climate. Unity is the biggest threat, by the way, to the spiritual forces of wickedness in the world. The spiritual forces of wickedness, the forces of evil have one agenda item, and that is to divide us up from one another. These forces react to unity by sowing seeds of distrust, sowing seeds of fear, trying to distance people from one another. And it is so easy to see in so many different examples all around us these days. But here's the thing. You and I have made a couple of promises. You and I have promised to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness. You and I have promised to reject the evil powers of this world. We just heard these promises made aloud. These promises are a part of our baptismal vows. Every single baptized United Methodist has made these promises. And we hear these promises every time we celebrate a baptism. Baptism in and of itself is a renunciation and a rejection of evil. Baptism is inherently unifying. How does the Spirit do that? Well, baptism is a means of grace. It's a means by which the Holy Spirit creates a community. It is a means by which and through which we become one body, maintaining the unity of the Holy Spirit. But if we're honest these days, it feels like being unified is just such hard work. It feels like being unified is a lot of work. And it's exhausting work sometimes. And so it begs the question, is it worth it? Is it? Is unity worth it? Is there inherent value to being unified? Is unity worth all this work? Is unity worth this struggle? Is it worth it? I'm going to fast forward to the end and tell you the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> but it's not an unconditional yes. There is a qualifier. The answer to the question, is unity worth it, is actually yes, if. So let's turn to today's scripture. Today's scripture passage comes from the book of Ephesians, a letter written by maybe Paul, we're not quite sure if he actually wrote the letter, to the church at Ephesus. Now the church at Ephesus is comprised of two very different groups, Gentiles and Jews. Dr. Mitzi Smith says, Ephesians reads like a legal document detailing a corporate merger. <laughs> God accomplishes this merger process by grace, bringing these two groups together. We cannot overstate how different these two groups were from one another. They have completely different worldviews. They have completely different religious frameworks. They have completely different ethical understandings. And from these two very, very polarized groups, God somehow or other creates one community. 
creates one body with Christ as the head. You can hear it, for example, in chapter 2, where we read, For Christ is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us, abolishing the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility between us. Putting to death the hostility between us. After three chapters of describing this corporate merger, Paul then turns to a plea. The beginning of chapter 4 that David read a second ago, Paul is actually begging his audience to live a life that is worthy of this calling, to live a life that is worthy of the calling of their baptism. It reads as if Paul is saying, look, God did all of this stuff for you. I've written three chapters about how God pulled you together and made you one body. And God did all of this for you so that you can be one. And now your role is to live a life that honors that work. Your role is to live a life that embodies that work. Don't cheapen the grace of God by living in a way that undoes that which has been done by the Holy Spirit. Live a life that's worth it. Live a life worthy of this call. And then he describes this life. He describes this life for us with words like humility and gentleness and patience and love. Anybody need me to hit that patience one again? <laughs> and one of the things that describes this life is to maintain the unity of the Spirit, the oneness of the Spirit. And he hits this point really hard, doesn't he? Because there's one body, there's one Spirit, there's one hope, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. It seems to me that being one is a pretty big deal here. I had a seminary professor who taught me, if it's repeated, it must be important. Be one, said Paul. Maintain the unity that the Spirit has created. And he doesn't beg us to create a unity based on a common interest. He doesn't beg us to create a unity based on our own priorities or our own values or our own lifestyles. No, he says a unity exists already. You don't have to create it. It exists. What you have to do is maintain that which is, not create something new. In fact... He says that maintaining the unity of the Spirit is a part of what it means to be mature spiritually. It's a part of what it means to grow in the faith. It's a part of our sanctification pro process. We have all been given diverse gifts, says Paul, and these gifts are given so that the body will be equipped for gro growth. The Spirit guides us to mature in faith together, growing closer and closer to God and growing closer and closer to one another as we do so until, until all of us, writes Paul, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. So, what does that mean? It means that a life that is worthy of our baptism is, among other things, a life that maintains and nurtures spiritual unity. And it's hard work to do that. So is it worth it? Here we come to the qualifier. This is the if. Is unity worth the work? The answer is yes, if. Is unity worth it? Yes, unity is worth it. If no harm is being done. Unity is worth it if no harm is being done. Author Bell Hooks writes about this. She writes, all too often we believe it's a sign of commitment, an expression of love 
to endure unkindness or cruelty, to forgive and forget. In actuality, she continues, when we love rightly, we know that the healthy, loving response to cruelty and abuse is putting ourselves out of harm's way. So yes, unity is worth it, but only if no harm is being done. Remember, the passage also includes humility, gentleness, patience, and love, and patience. Can you hit that one again? Anybody? You see, having a difference of opinion, well, that's one thing. But holding a perspective that leads to actions that hurt other people is unacceptable. Because the first rule, now and always, is do no harm. What's the first rule, church? Say it with me. Do no harm. The church of Jesus Christ cannot ask those who are being abused to remain in community with those who are abusing them without calling out the abuse that's being done. Or in other words, without renouncing the spiritual forces of wickedness and rejecting the evil powers of this world. But if that happens and harm is removed from the relationship, if the harm is removed from the community, then yes, the hard work of unity is definitely worth it. And I happen to be very proud of the way that Manchester United Methodist Church lives out this kind of unity. Clearly, one of the values of this congregation is that we are one body here in this place, regardless of so many demographic differences we might have, so much diversity we have among ourselves, including diversity of theological perspective. Differences, questions, and doubts are in fact encouraged, nay, I say celebrated. We're doing an entire worship series called Got Questions, for goodness sakes. You can ask your questions on a little piece of paper today out in the lobby. Questions, differences, doubts are all welcome because it doesn't impact our unity. It doesn't impact our oneness. And this is true across all age groups, not just for grown-ups, but starting with the kids themselves. We utilize this philosophy within our children's ministry. I remember going to Sunday school when I was a kid a long, long time ago, and the teacher would get up and tell the story about the Bible, and then we would do a craft about the Bible, and then she would ask us about which, what's this guy's name, and what's this lady's name, and, and then we would sing a song about that story, and then we'd get the paper. Remember the paper? We got to get a paper, and you'd go and you'd show your parents the paper, and be like, that's a cool paper, and then it'd end up in the back seat of the car, and it just stayed in the floor of the back seat of the car until you went to the car wash and eventually threw it away again, and that was, that was Sunday school, right? Here at Manchester, there's a different approach. We still have a crafts, and we still have music. We still have stories from the Bible, but the philosophy is different. The content is different. It's called the Good Shepherd Curriculum. A storyteller tells the story essentially straight from Scripture, using wooden figures to sort of demonstrate the story. And then after the story is told, the storyteller asks the children what are called wondering questions. Wondering questions are beautiful because they do not have a right or wrong answer. They are conversation prompts. They just allow kids to come up with their own answer. Not telling them what to think, but encouraging them to think. So, for example, this week, the story was Elijah's story. And one of the wondering questions they had was, I wonder how the fire came and burned up the altar and all that water. The question is posed, and then here's the thing. Adults are actually forbidden from saying anything at that point, and the kids then answer the question. So one of them might say, I bet it came down like lightning from the sky and made a big explosion when it hit it. And then the other kids will go, oh yeah, that's right. That's probably how it happened. And another kid will say, no, I bet it swirled up from the ground and made a, like a tornado of fire. Oh no, that's cooler. I like that one. And someone will say, no, I bet you God just snuck in with a match and just lit it when nobody was looking because God can do that, right? So... So the kids engage the story with no right or wrong answer. And you know what they're learning? They're learning that they can disagree with their friends about stuff. And they're still friends afterwards. 
that they can have a completely different perspective on this story from Scripture with their friend, and then they go have a donut with them after the class is over, right? How about that? How would it be if every child learned that their church was a safe space to disagree with your friends and still end up being a friend afterwards? If this sounds cool to you, have I got an opportunity for you. <laughs> Saturday morning, 9 to 11, Good Shepherd Training in Fellowship Hall. Sign up today. I believe it's one of the opportunities to respond later on. Here's the deal. Here's what I think. In this congregation, like in 98% of United Methodists in Missouri, unity is the rule. Unity is the rule. And it's a unity that does not insist on uniformity, but allows us to celebrate freedom, freedom of opinion, freedom of perspective, as long as those opinions and perspectives do no harm. I know it's a hard time to be talking about unity. I know it's a weird time to be thinking about our essential oneness in the Spirit, but maybe, and hear me out, maybe it's actually the best time for us to be doing that. Maybe it's the best time for us to be saying, hey, is your heart right? Then give me your hand. Hey, do you love God? Guess what? I do too. Let's be church together. That's all it takes. That's all it takes for us to be one in Christ Jesus, unified by the power of the Spirit, because Christian unity does not come from shared opinions. It does not come from universe, uniformity of perspective. It does not come from identical social contexts. Christian unity exists because the Holy Spirit has made us one. And our role is just to maintain the unity that the Spirit has created. I'm not trying to minimize it. I know it's hard work. But it's a part of maturing in faith. It's a part of growing closer to God. It's a part of our sanctification. But if it is done well, and if it is done in alignment with the direction of the Spirit, yes, yes, absolutely, unity is worth it. Amen? Amen.